Hello everybody. Oh, it's so great to have you all here. Welcome back. This is all so exciting. I'd like you to meet Matt, my editor and producer of these podcasts. Of course, you might remember the lovely ones we did last year, the lockdown lunches. Well, we've decided to cheer ourselves up and do cocktails with Patty. We have indeed, and uh, we've got a really exciting series coming. Um, Patty, why don't you tell us a little bit about what people can expect from this season? Well, I just thought we all like to be cheered up and nothing like a cocktail, but especially a cocktail that might be mixed by your favorite rock and roll artist. So what I've done is I've invited a few of my friends to tell me what their favorite cocktail is. So then I went to their houses, we did a mix and a drink and couldn't stop telling funny stories. Brilliant. And so who's our first guest for this episode? Our first guest is the wonderful Gary Brooker. You probably remember Gary's most beautiful velvety voice as he sang White A Shade Of Pale back in the old days. It still is a favorite of mine. I love that song. Don't you, Matt? I, absolutely, yeah. So shall we jump in to this episode and uh, yeah. listen to Gary? to amuse you for oh, one second. On tape, yes. as they say. Now, many, many years ago, Gary, I was in John Lennon's painted Rolls Royce with all the other Beatles, and we were completely out of it, which always happens when you take LSD, going down through the country roads to Brian Epstein, their manager's house, for a big party. And on John's record player, was white a shade of pale, white a shade of pale, white a shade of pale. So we heard it all the way down. So this is firmly embedded in my head and my memory. And so when I met you, it was an utter joy, Gary. Oh, what a nice man. Well, that was the, did the fool paint that Rolls Royce? They did. Well, Frankie and I, on New Year's Eve, probably in 1967, we were walking down King's Road and we'd been in some pubs. I don't know why we were on our own or we'd left some people, but it was getting too noisy for us. It was just, so we walked back up the King's Road towards where we lived in St. John's Wood, you know, going that way. And then I saw the Rolls Royce, just parked at the side of the King's Road there. And the door opened and his voice said, hey, Gary, quick, in here. And I could hear a white shade of pale playing and it was John Lennon sitting there on New Year's Eve, <laughs> with a white shade of pale going through his little record player thing. <laughs> yes. Who's still doing it at Christmas. Yeah. Oh, Or bless rather, him. Ne the next year nearly. Yeah, you see, we loved it so much, Gary. <laughs> we toured with the Beatles when I was in the Paramounts in 1965 in the UK. Oh. Did the British tour. Oh. We were kind of a small act. Like Moody Blues finished the first half and Beatles second half. I don't remember seeing you there, but I it never was went so, to that so, he so hectic. Yes. You know, they were trapped, yeah. you know, in the, and they weren't great theatres with great dressing rooms at all. But they were trapped as soon when they, when they managed to get there, you know, hiding and running and everything. I mean, in Newcastle, I think it was, I was talking to John Lennon, he said, oh, I fancy going out now. Go and get some fish and chips. Will you come with me? I said, yeah, we'll just go and get some. So it was like five o'clock or something. It was raining in Newcastle, it was dark. It was like early December. And we went and got some fish and chips. John put on a, you know, peaked hat and some glasses and that. Because otherwise, if it had got recognized, you imagine, a little mob could soon turn into a massive crowd that gets yeah. dangerous, it's horrible. <clears throat> yeah. So he was disguised. Nobody recognised him in the chip shop or anything, so we walked out the road and had a newspaper and fish and chips. Thoroughly enjoyed it. We got back to the to the uh, dress it, you know, stage door, <laughs> uh, banged on it, and this kind of stage door man came in a uni you know a uniform like they sometimes have, and John said, "I'm with the Beatles." 
He said, you couldn't come in here if you were John Lennon himself. He said, <laughs> he, did. he said, but I am John Lennon. I said, he is. He is. And he, he finally went, oh, you know, I think he took the hat and glasses off him. <laughs> he let him in. So anyway, I'm here in your house, Gary, because you're going to make a most fabulous cocktail for me. This is one you love. Even though I've brought a cocktail shaker with me, you don't need one, do no, you? No, this, this one is stirred, Patty. Stirred is the, you know, that's stirred, what Stirred, not shaken. Stirred. stirred, not shaken. Yeah. And we've got all the ingredients here. I see you have brought the rum, because it's a rum cocktail. We have a choice. I wasn't sure which rum you preferred, so I brought Havana Club and Mount Gay. Well, they're both gold, which is the golden colour. Yeah. Not dark and not white. Mm -hmm. Very important. That one's from Cuba and it looks extremely good. Let's try that. <laughs> I'm dying to go to Cuba. Let's try that. All right. We'll crack it open. We need um, Collins glasses, which is a tall, straight glass. Yeah. I'm going to fill it, each glass, because we've got to make two, with uh, ice cubes. Get some chink. Ah. Yeah. Don't be tight on the ice, you can fill the whole glass. Yeah. Next, I've got Angostura bitters here. Mm -hmm. Three dashes we had, so I've got to put it in both glasses. Mm -hmm. We've got that here. Now we get our golden rum. I put in the recipe one part, two parts rum, sorry. That's only one part. It looks all right. Yes. Well, the other bit will be a half part then, if we do it in proportions, because the lime, freshly squeezed lime juice, we now have half as much to, as the rum. Okay. So I've said two parts rum, one part lime juice. All right. Very cocktail thing. This is to yes. stop the limes falling out of the freshly squeezed lime juice. This is very impressive, Gary. I turn my measure around and we've got a half. Do you and know what? Ginger beer. I think we're nearly there. We just we give that just a little stir with our cocktail stirrer. You've got everything here. I'm terribly impressed. It's taken years of collecting to have these things. But I remember many years ago, you used to have a pub called the Parrot Inn. Yes, loved it. Yeah, mm. Parrot Inn Forest Green, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we used to have great fun there. I mean, I, I didn't work in it. No, of course not. I'm getting thirsty here. Anyway, now we've got our ginger beer. Is it any good? Oh, yes, that's all right. So we're putting a ginger beer to taste. So we'll try that. And then when you taste it, you just think, no, I'd like a bit more ginger beer. Or if you want less ginger beer, it's very hard to take it out once yeah. you put it in. So you have Tricky. to put in more rum. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And a bit of decoration, a wedge of lime on the side of the glass. This looks like a fabulous cocktail. Well, you mind your eye on that cocktail stick. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, Gary. And let a drink at lunchtime for ages. Well, a year. Oh, I see. That is delicious. <gasps> That's delicious. Mmm. Oh, there's plenty of lime in it, isn't there? The lime and the ginger sit so comfortably together. And then that rum just warms the whole thing up. What a combination. And see, Angostura bitter, that is so subtle, because we've only got a few drops. Yeah, yeah. But it makes all the difference. Lunch, no. It just, uh, it's, did, most um, one, it's a wonderful ingredient, isn't it? Well, cheers. Cheers. I'm nice loving this. I'm here. loving this. I mean, now, Gary, just tell me about the pub, because I seem to remember being in there well after hours. Well, <laughs> if you were nice, and if you knew the landlord, then you could, yeah, you'd always get invited. It's perfectly legal anyway. But didn't we have music there? Oh, we were playing live, uh, playing sort of bluesy and old favourites. Eric, Eric came and played. And, and my ex-brother-in-law came over to stay with us, so he dragged him along, Mick Fleetwood, to play drums. Oh, yes, he's played. Yeah, Do you remember? He slow down? I didn't think he would, but he does. Okay. By three in the morning, he was... Everything was at half pace. <laughs> Bless him. 
<laughs> no, we had some great people turn up. You know, it's always hard to remember. I remember one night, it was a good past three o'clock, and we started at like ten, with the occasional, you know, little boys room stop. And Eric said to me, how much longer are we doing? <laughs> and I, I had this huge book with like every song I'd ever heard. Every blues, every rock, every R&B. And I, I looked at this list and I said, there's only two more. And there was only two more on it. And it must have been, God knows, wow. you know, a couple of hundred songs in there at least. And we'd done them all. Oh, my gosh. But I said, there's only two more to go. He said, oh, <laughs> Christ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. That was a wonderful, yeah, wonderful time. Yeah, it was good, uh, good blues nights. Well, I had a nice time with Eric there. And then after that, he, he uh, said, do you want to... Oh, she's, do you want do you want to join the band? His band at the time, Gosh. which I did, and had a great couple of years with that. Yeah. This cocktail, by the way, is called the Commander. Okay. Yes. Thank you, the Commander. Yes. Right. Um, <clears throat> and I have been called the Commander. I think it's because I was the leader of the group or something. You know, the band. And I, I quite liked it. You know, but it's better. Once that time we were in the Bahamas with Eric, that I was. I was called Hornby, and I was kind of, I think that double, it was like 007, but he wasn't quite that good. This Hornby, and I sort of took on this persona, I was even going to the recording sessions in white dinner suit, you know, white dinner jacket. But <laughs> I really thought I was this Hornby of the, you know, 007 crew. But where I got the name was when we were in oh, somewhere like Chester in England on tour, I hadn't gone to the bar. And Chaz and Dave and Eric and everybody else had. And so they came up looking for me to my room. Now, what I'd done, I had bought a model railway the sort of day before, and I'd set it all up in my hotel room with, you know, viaducts going over the telephone books and under the bed through the tunnel and back out the other side. And like they shoved into my room, and there I am, choop, 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 <laughs> with my train going around. They, well, girl's got a train set. And, uh, it, they, they, they called me Hornby after that. How oh, like, funny, of it course. It was a Hornby railway. Of you know. course. <laughs> I think I thought I was a commander. I've always liked boats a bit. Never had one, but I always make sure I know somebody who has. And I think we were drinking after a gig in Copenhagen in the Elephant Bar. And I had a kind of a, an Admiral's kind of jacket, which I wore sometimes on stage. This drunken Dane came up to me and he sort of pushed me a bit. And um, he said, yeah, you're not in the Navy, you're not in the British Army, what are you? I said, I'm a commander in the British Rock Force. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, oh. <laughs> he shut him up and after that I thought, well, yes, that's what I'll be. Commander, British Rock Force. <laughs> I love that. That's great, Gary. Yeah. But I, I love the combination of taste. Rather like food and cooking. You know, you add different spices, different herbs for the most wonderful effect at the end of the day. Um, and same with cocktails. Adding different spices, different, different flavours to create something quite delicious. I mean, inventing cocktails is an extremely dangerous occupation. Well, you'd have to, I would like I to I don't learn. think for the mixologist, I mean, yes. somebody like me. Yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it takes a long time to get it right. Yes. Um, by the time you have, you, you know, you're, it's finished, you're over. It's <laughs> bedtime. And if you're just about to go on stage, that's extremely dangerous. <laughs> yes. Uh, I invented one called Toujours L'Amour, which is a very nice title. It was the, one of the songs that we just had out on an album with Procore. And it was, well, I, I know the recipe now, but it was triple sec, which is a white orange liqueur, kirsch, yeah. which is a white cherry eau de vie, and parfait amour, which is a bowls drink that is a beautiful purple colour. And um, equal parts of each of those three on ice stir it and drink it. But it took me a long time to get that combination right. And we were playing that night, and it was in Tokyo. 
And it was, well, I didn't feel too bad, but I shouldn't have, you know, it was, I've never been like that anywhere else ever, because it was strong stuff. And we bumped into some Americans, they came to our dressing room, who were on R&R &R from Vietnam. And they said, you want to smoke at this? I thought, oh, yeah, go on, you know. I said, we're on in five minutes, it's just a quick toke. And um, God, it was absolutely knock you over, up your tree stuff. And this was on top of like eight two jewels on yours anyway. <laughs> and we went on. So I, I was singing all right and playing all right. You thought? Well, we did the introduction number, yeah. which was called Bringing Home the Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and we finished it. And I, I just sitting there, and I thought, oh, I enjoyed that. So I started it again. And we played all the way through it a second time. On stage? And then I, yeah. I thought, what if anybody noticed? I think I'll start it again, just for a, a bit of a laugh. I started it again, and, you know, voices from the side saying, Gary, Gary, what? you're messing, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, right, OK. And I was all right after that. But Mr Udo, the great Japanese promoter, hadn't, didn't speak to me for 15 or 20 years. <laughs> really? It was a bit of a <clears throat> an insult to... Uh, in, yes. in, in Japan, that kind yes. of thing. <laughs> Gary, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a joy talking to you. Oh, I hope and so. And joyous drinking a fabulous um, cocktail with you too. A lovely commander, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. Certainly did. Thank you, commander. Just a thing for the summer day, which will be coming. Yeah. Rum in the sun. I want to thank Gary Brooker so much for that really great interview and a little insight into what it's like being Gary, particularly the story of him being on stage and falling in love in his madness with one song, but he couldn't stop singing it. <laughs> Poor Gary. Anyway, it was a wonderful, wonderful podcast, Gary. Thank you so much. Yeah, excellent, excellent first episode. I love that story of uh, him and uh, John Lennon getting fish and chips. One incredible moment. <laughs> yes, fantastic. <laughs> it's so good. Yeah. Um, so I just want to share about where you can find out more about what Patty's doing um, and stay connected with the podcast and, and everything else that's coming up. So if you're on Facebook, you want to look for official Patty Boyd. If you're on Instagram, it's at Patty Boyd official. If you're on Twitter, it's at the Patty Boyd. And YouTube, which is something new that we're going to be exploring, you want to search for Patty Boyd Official. And uh, if you're listening to this, you can actually watch this episode. Um, and in a minute, we're going to go out and feed the swans. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can follow us and we can feed the swans. And if you're just listening, we're going to finish this episode any minute. But Patty, do you want to talk a little bit about what's happening in next week's episode? Yeah, next week's episode um, is me talking to my friend Nick Cook who's a sort of he's he's great fun he's really smart and he knows how to drink and he knows how to tell a really good story and um, so here's someone to look out for he's our next guest